All right, if I could have your attention, please. Thank you. Uh, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask before I begin my lecture for, uh, for today? Um, anything having to do with the course? Uh, I think your papers are due, um, I'm, I believe, a week from today, but I'd have to, is that correct? Yeah, so a week from today. Um, and they must be handed uh, 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 over to me in class, at the end of class uh, on Thursday. Okay, yes? Do you want like a cover sheet? No, 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 no. Let's not waste paper, be ecological, you know. No, no cover sheet, just write your name on top, cover, I mean a title, and, and get straight into the paper. And as I said, don't waste pages on bibliographies and all of that. I mean, if you're using outside sources just at the end of the paper, just give me a short bibliography. You don't need to, you, you don't need to have extra paper for that. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Well, so you know, I've explained a number of times. It's very simple, actually. If you're using sources from this syllabus, let's say you're using Kilnani the idea of India. All you have to do is at the end of that sentence where you have used Kilani, give me Kilani comma page 52. I know you're using the idea of India. Okay, if it, if it happens to be Amartya Sen, there, are, there is more than one source from Amartya Sen. There are a couple of his writings, so then you want to have um, Sen comma and uncertain glory comma page 52. That's all. If you're using an outside source which is not on the syllabus, then you need to give me the full citation. As simple as that. Yes? Uh, Frankly, you know, it doesn't really matter because you're not going to have dozens of them in a five-page paper and you're going to be using mainly, mainly sources from the syllabus. Um, but, you know, if you want to have them footnotes at the bottom of each page, Fine, you can have them as end notes as well. I, I'm not really particular about it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm particular about what you write, the substance of the paper. That's what I'm particular about. Okay, and that the citation should not be in random fashion. You shouldn't have some footnotes and some end notes, you know, mixing up the MLA style and the Chicago style. You have to learn how to do proper footnoting, but you just one consistent style. You know, I've mentioned that before. Yeah, okay. Anything else that. Uh, anybody would like to query me about before I begin? So what I want to do is I want to just take a little bit of time to finish up the discussion about uh, economics, uh, political economy, development, well-being. That's been the subject that we've been talking about uh, this week. Uh, and we did a little bit of that, of course, last week as well, beginning with Sainat's uh, uh, talk, uh, although he was talking more generally about rural India. Uh, and uh, what I've been uh, uh, describing to you are uh, uh, so far uh, looking at various sectors of Indian society were some of the some of the failures. I mean, and we started by looking at what happened in the post-1947 period that you had systematic state planning, you had something called the Planning Commission, you had five-year plans, uh, state-owned utilities, uh, and then in my last lecture, what I talked to you about was the opting out of the state by the middle class. I gave a number of different illustrations of what I meant by that, by looking at transportation sector, communication sector, uh, and the growth of the middle class, and then finally what I call the evisceration, that is the wiping out of something called the commons. Okay, uh, this, uh, this is what we've been talking about so far. Let me just put in a few general thoughts as well right now, which once I've mentioned them, I think the argument will become uh, reasonably uh, uh, clear, uh, but you know, if I don't mention it, then you might not think about it. Uh, namely the following, that you know, if you're comparing the development of India with the development of states in the West, what you have to remember is that capitalist industrialization in countries such as Britain, France, and so on, really began in some respects before the rise of modern democracy. Right? That, that you know, if you look at Britain, Britain had colonies. And of course, its most famous colony and its largest colony was, of course, India. Right? And, and it's not as if you had democracy in Britain before colonialism. So what we're saying is that the conditions under which capitalist industrialism be, f flourished in the West were dramatically different. You had all of these lands that obviously were being appropriated. The wealth of these was being appropriated. Now, those are not the conditions under which India 
ventures forth in its experiment with democracy. Right? Th that's something that, uh, that's a difference that I think that you really do have to bear in mind. It also means that in India, when the state and civil society embarked on the project of development, you already had people who were highly sensitive in many cases to some of the problems of development, which I've already discussed. What happens when you decide to put up a dam, a big dam, right? So that reading that you had from week two by Arundhati Roy, uh, uh, you know, written of course in, in masterful prose, highly polemical as well, but she's basing it on the evidence so she does a close study of the evidence and what, what, one of the things that she found out was that this whole Narmada River Valley project uh, where the Indian state was going to build dozens of dams, that this involved displacing a huge number of people and who are the people who are being displaced? It's people who are powerless, tribal people, working class people. Okay? The equivalent in the United States would be, just giving you one illustration. Now, you know you've got hazardous wastes. There are all kinds of hazardous wastes. For example, electronics, you know, you throw away computers, well, that's hazardous waste. And I'm not even talking about nuclear waste. That's hazardous waste, too. Well, where do you think hazardous waste is going to be buried? One of the things they found out, people who, who work on these things, is that the vast majority of the communities in the vicinity of which you're going to bury hazardous waste are poor communities in America. Nobody's going to dump hazardous waste in, in the middle of Beverly Hills. You're going to dump it in areas where African American lives, American Indian live, and so forth and so on. That's what happens. Now, so what, what I'm suggesting to you very simply is that when you have these projects of the state, these huge development projects, people get displaced. There are all kinds of problems here that we have to think about fundamentally, right? And these are people who are, in a sense, paying the price for this development. They are these sacrificial, you know, lamps, okay? And one fundamental difference between the development and growth of the economy in India and development as it took place in the United States was that most of the development took place here before the rise of a political sensibility among the working classes. So the state could achieve most of its projects without having to worry about people resisting. Now in India, that's been the problem, that when this dam project started, the, the, the activists mobilized tribal people, working class people, and said, well, do you realize what's happening? Your communities are just going to be wiped out. Because of course, when you have these huge dam projects, what happens, they have to inundate, flood huge areas of land. Right? That's, how, that's, how, that's what happens when you build a dam. Well, whose areas are going to get inundated and get flooded? It's not the wealthy or the middle class that's paying the price for that. Right? So these are some differences you have to bear in mind, that the circumstances under which India embarked on this whole project of development and what happened in the West, I think, are actually really quite different. Now, when we were sketching out this whole thing about you know, economic well-being, development, so forth and so on, the Amartya Sen reading obviously gives you statistics about a great many things that I haven't talked about and I don't need to because the readings and the lectures supplement each other. I'm not going to repeat everything that you find in the readings and the readings are not necessarily going to tally entirely with the lecture. So a very good illustration of that, just simply to alert you to it, however, uh, and also to suggest what might be some of the limitations in the Sen Dress book. Okay? A very good illustration of that would be the question of female-male ratio, FMR, as it's very often known in the literature. Now, India is one of a handful of countries in the world, just a handful of countries. And the other countries where, of, of which what I'm going to say is true, of which this is true, uh, the problem that I'm going to outline now, are largely countries in South Asia. It's true in Pakistan. It's true in Bangladesh. The argument that I'm going to give to you now. And what is the argument? That India is a group of a handful of countries where there are substantially fewer females than males. In most countries in the world, women are going to outnumber. Women and girls, females, are going to outnumber males. Okay? Uh, the, you know, 
in, in nature, so to speak, you have more or less a 50-50 divide, more or less a 50-50 divide. You know what the ratio in India is? For every 100 males, you have 93 females. That's a huge gender gap, a huge gender gap. China is one of the other countries where we've had an acute problem with that, uh, partly, partly, not entirely because of the one-child policy, when if you have a one-child policy and particularly rural families want a son, okay, to inherit the land, to work the land, and so what do you do? You abort the female fetus. And in India, this problem was acute for many years. So there's this test which is actually outlawed in India officially. If you, by the way, go to most Indian hospitals, they have a little sign outside the hospital saying that this hospital does not conduct amniocentesis or, or sex selection tests. Okay, it says that openly there. And so what is amniocentesis? Amniocentesis is a procedure whereby you can determine the sex of the fetus and then if it happens to be a female and you don't want a female, you abort it. And one of the things they found at a very famous hospital in Bombay, okay, um, about 15, 20 years ago, there were 50,000 fetuses that were aborted over a period of like 10 years. All of them were female, all 50,000. Okay. So that, that's sex selection. And that's, of course, one of the reasons why you've got fewer females than males. But the other reasons too. Right? And, the other re and, and, and that has to do with neglect of female children in a rural household. It may be very common where there's shortage of food that the men will eat first and then after the men it will be the boys and then it will be the females in the family, whatever is left over and there may not be left over, enough left over. These kinds of things have been widely reported. But here is the interesting problem. Okay, I'm not going to try to help you resolve the problem right now because in order to do that I'm going to have to give a whole lecture on what might be some of the difficulties with this liberal viewpoint. Because what is the viewpoint that is represented by Amartya Sen and John Dres? They're writing as highly educated liberals who are of course anguished as indeed they should be and as indeed we should be anguished by the fact that you have a massive discrepancy between females and males in India, in Pakistan, in Bangladesh and a few other countries in the world. But the, most of the countries are in South Asia. Right? Now, but what is the limitation? The limitation is this. They don't address, for example, the problem that you would expect ordinarily that when a s people get more educated in a society, when people get more educated, and especially when women get more educated and girls get more educated, that the female-male ratio is going to improve. That's what you would expect. Now we do know that there has been a substantial increase in female literacy. Looking at it nationwide, I'm not looking at, remember, I want to again reiterate that there are certain pockets of India where female literacy is virtually zero, virtually, or it's 3% or 5%. Some tribal area, some area where you have Dalit women or tribal women, okay, and the state's resources have not been put into their education at all. And in, but if you look at India as a totality, we are saying there's been, a, there's been a substantial increase. Of course, nothing of the magnitude that there should have been. But if you have gone from an increase of 20% female literacy to 65%, that's still fairly substantial. Okay? In terms of the number of females that now we could say have become literate. Well, if there's been such an increase, why is it that the female-male ratio has deteriorated. Deteriorated. Right? Now there really, frankly, there's no explanation. There really is no explanation. And one very interesting thing I want to tell you, okay, and we're going to look at it again much later on when we're going to look at it in a different context, and that'll be the section when we look at gender and women. We've got a whole section devoted to that particular subject. And what I want to tell you is they have found out that the most privileged neighborhoods, the richest neighborhoods in the country, are the neighborhoods where the female-male ratio is the worst of all. That's what they found out. 
In fact, in fact, a, a mere one mile from where I stay, in my, I have a home in, you know, in, in Delhi as well, a mere one mile from that, that is more or less the epicenter of this problem. Okay? And that's a well-to-do neighborhood. So, this, so, so the liberal imagination is going to be at a bit of a loss to explain exactly why is it that among highly educated households, you find that the female-male ratio is also extremely bad. Okay? So this is something that we're going to return to later on, but I'm just trying to suggest to you that there are some issues that cannot be resolved merely by dishing out statistics, which in effect what San Andres are really attempting to do. And we could go through every sector of this question of well-being and development in a similar fashion. We could look at population, we could look at female-male ratio, education, literacy, healthcare, so forth and so on. We've only looked at some of them because we obviously cannot look at each sector in great detail. I do, however, want to spend a few minutes before I wrap up my discussion of this and move on to the question of politics. Um, what I do want to do very briefly is I want to look at some of the ameliorative measures undertaken by the state. So what has the Indian government, what has the Indian state done? Okay, and again, this is not giving you a, an, a complete picture. Obviously, that's impossible in a lecture of this kind. I just want to give you a little bit of an indication. So one fundamental problem that the Indian government tried to resolve, or, some, or they tried to resolve it in some states, was the problem of land reform. Okay, because the feeling was, and I think that I would agree that this is, uh, this is a problem, that if you're going to try to address the question of inequality, you have to address the question of land reform. Okay, who owns land? And in a country where in 1947 the, the economy was predominantly, overwhelmingly agriculture, then it's very important. Who has access to land? Are most of the people who are working on the land, are they landless laborers or do they actually own a piece of the land? Right? The equivalent question in America, for example, how do you judge the economy? One of the standard indices, I'm sure you know that if you think about it, is home ownership. What are home ownership rates like? If you find that there's a huge plunge in home ownership rates over a period of 15 years, immediately you know that there's some problem in the economy. Right? Because people will generally invest in a house when they feel reasonably confident about the economy and they have the means to do so. So in India, one of the things that they wanted to do in many places was to say that, well, we have to arrest this problem. We have to try to make sure that people actually have access to land. That if a, that if a family has been tilling that land for three generations, do they have ownership rights over that land? And there are lots of problems in India, by the way. So if, even if you have ownership, well, how do you demonstrate that you have ownership because it might be customary ownership and when I say customary ownership what I mean by that is you may not actually have a piece of paper which shows that you have ownership over this piece of property and that's one of the problems by the way with the alienation alienation here means sale right the alienation of tribal land because remember what I mentioned in one of my previous lectures that by law in India tribal land cannot be sold cannot be alienated to non-tribal populations very often, however, the problem is that in most tribal communities, the ownership of land is both communal, meaning that it's held as a collectivity rather than by an individual, and B, it's customary. And C, because it's communal and customary, therefore, usually, the people, the, tri the, the tribal population there, will actually have no paperwork showing that they have ownership of this land. And of course, when you have high degrees of, of, of illiteracy, that compounds a problem because if you're going to show ownership of land, you must be able to sign your name. And most people can't do that in these areas. And what, what to speak of these areas, I can tell you the story of my maternal grandmother who was completely illiterate. Okay, My maternal grandmother. And when she left India for the first time because couple of her children had settled overseas, including an aunt of mine who had settled in, in Canada, right? So one of her daughters who had settled in Canada, and then when my maternal grandmother was getting on in her years, so she, uh, uh, her daughter said, well, why don't you come and visit us in Canada? Well, if you're going to visit somebody, you need a passport. 
And, if, and, and when she applied for a passport, you know that you have to sign your name. And in India, by the way, that usually means 30 signatures for everything. Okay? And you have to be able to sign your name 30 times the same way. You can't sign, sign it 30 different ways. And so I remember sitting down with her for a week and just teaching her how to sign her name the same way every time. Okay? And that's my maternal grandmother coming from a rather you know, well-to-do, certainly a middle-class household. And what are you going to do with tribal people? And so you, you'd have to think about all of these issues when you start thinking about, well, how are you going to move people from one level to another level? How are you going to have something called development? So now, on the question of land, I'm, I'm sort of sketching out some of the problems that you'd have to immediately think about. Right? Now how do you demonstrate ownership, so forth and so on? But very simply, giving you one illustration here of land reform. So you have what was called the Zamindari Abolition Act. Zamindar means landlord, big landlords. So the idea was you remove these big landlords. Okay, Zamindari Abolition Act in the state of Bihar. And what it did, what did it do? It gave rights to the land to cultivators, the people who had been cultivating the, the land, tilling the land for generations perhaps in some cases, that they would have rights to this land. Now, of course, if you're going to have rights to this land, there are people who are going to get dispossessed or people who have made a false claim on that land, right? And so, so this was going to be challenged in the courts, but then the Supreme Court, it eventually goes to the Supreme Court just shortly after this act is passed because, of course, the Supreme Court in India does exactly what the Supreme Court in the United States does, that if there are legislative measures which somebody wants to contest, well, eventually it goes to the courts. And the Supreme Court is the, the highest court of the land. So the Supreme Court ruled that land reform is exempted from challenge based on the constitutional protection of fundamental rights, that cultivators had a fundamental protection that was given to them by the Constitution. Okay? And the Fourth Amendment to the Constitution gave states the right to impose land ceilings. What do I mean by land ceilings? That, for example, we're taking a random figure that in a certain state, no one could own more than 100 acres of land. You could not own more than 100 acres of land. So let's supposing you had 500 acres of land and now the state passes a bill saying you cannot own more than 100 acres, so you get deprived of 400 acres. What do you think people did to circumvent? Because of course they circumvented the law immediately. What would be one of the ways in which you circumvented? Very simple. Most families in India, especially rural families, would be joint families joint families. So I've got 500 acres of land. Now the bill has been passed saying that I can't own more than 100 acres, so that's fine. I just put 100 acres in the name of my daughter, 100 acres in the name of my niece, 100 acres in the name of my nephew, but I'm still controlling the land. That's how they circumvented the law. Right? So then, of course, you had to, you had to then somehow take care of that, and of course these things become very difficult. But in, in any case, what is going to, this land, this particular act is going to be superseded by what is called the Land Reform Act of 1950, which was intended to be a much more comprehensive measure. Um, and I want to just add one more element to this story, and uh, this story of land reform and so forth and so on, and that is that um, in the 1950s, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the most well-known disciples of uh, Mahatma Gandhi, a man by the name of Vinoba Bhave, Right, so now this man had a reputation as a saint working in Gandhian's ideas, using Gandhi's strategies. And so what did Vinoba Bhave do? He decided to walk the width and breadth of the land of India, would walk from village to village encouraging people who had large tracts of land to renounce their land in part, to give give away some of their agricultural land to the cultivators. Okay? And this was a movement, this was called Bhūdān. Bhūdān means the gift of the land. Dān means gift. Bhū means land. Okay? Dān, gift, land, gift of the land. One of the things they found out, so you know, then the government said, hey, well, this has been a highly successful movement because, you know, 50,000 acres have been gifted by landlords to cultivators. Well, over the years, one of the things they found out was that virtually all the land that had been gifted, virtually all of it, was land that was agriculturally useless. 
So for example, it's in, it's in, it's in the middle of a desert, it's just a hillock, the land cannot be tilled. Right? So these, there were various kinds of measures, some which were state sanctioned and some which were morally sanctioned, such as this one here, but they were frankly not really particularly successful. Yes? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, there, there are issues of that kind as well. I mean, if we started looking at it in detail, there'd be a bit of a mockery, frankly. Uh, I, I, in my view, the only place where they had successful land reform was the state of Kerala, which was a state ruled by the Communist Party, and the Communist Party there with a, with a stroke of the pen just simply introduced a kind of a equality that was not possible anywhere else in the Union of India. And when we look very briefly at the communist parties in India, uh, which you have to remember are electoral parties. I mean, these are all electoral legislative parties. Or these, are, these are all legally sanctioned. We're not talking about extra constitutional parties or anything of that kind. They're all part of what you might describe as the electoral uh, spectacle of India. Uh, so when we look at the communist parties very briefly in another lecture, then at that point I'm going to look a little bit at what happened in Kerala. Uh, so now these ameliorative measures, I want to look briefly at these three, these three, and then we're done with this whole section. Okay, so one of them, the ameliorative measures, is what is called M.G. Narega. It's usually the M.G. is not mentioned there, but it means Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi and Narega is a National Rural Employment Guarantee Act. And what did the National... Um, Rural Employment Guarantee Act. This is the first page of this act, okay? Uh, 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 introduced in 2005, September of 2005. Uh, and the first big paragraph there says, an act to provide for the enhancement of livelihood security of the households in rural areas of the country by providing at least 100 days of guaranteed wage employment in every financial year to every household whose adult members volunteer to do unskilled manual work and for matters connected herewith. Okay, so very plainly what, what Narega is saying is this act, which the Indian government has described as the greatest social measure ever undertaken anywhere in the world, that's how the Indian government describes it, to lift people out of poverty, to lift tens of millions of people ostensibly out of poverty. What does the act do? It simply says that every rural household will be entitled to have one adult member, male or female, okay, one adult member of that household be given a guaranteed employment for 100 days every calendar year or every financial year. 100 days out of 365, the idea being that, this, that if you can give at least 100 days, okay, it doesn't specify obviously the wage, right? It doesn't specify the wage. So you have, to, you have to implicitly understand that it's gonna be minimum wage in that particular state, okay? And it might vary from state to state. So that in every household, somebody can send one adult member to a public works project, it could be digging up wells, it could be digging up a road, could be doing any number of things, planting trees, right? And of course this is intended to, to give some assurance to families that no matter how hard the times are, you know, everybody else in the family is unemployed, there's gonna be one person in your family that's gonna get employment as a wage laborer doing unskilled labor for at least 100 days of the year. Okay, so this is very much in effect even now, today. Uh, there's been mixed results. We would have to do a very detailed inventory of what happened in certain states, why it's been more successful in some states and been less successful in, in, in other states. Uh, then there are all kinds of questions. Well, how do you actually get money to people? And you might say, well, isn't that rather simple? You just hand them over a check. Well, what are they going to do with a check? Because most of the people in rural areas do not have a bank account. They don't have a bank account, right? So, if, so then you hand over cash, right? That was, that was what, so these are what are called direct cash transfers. Because at, in some places, what they had proposed was that rather than giving them cash, they would, give them, they would give them goods in kind. What would that mean? It would mean, for example, again, you're taking a random figure. It could mean 20 kilograms of rice, 10 kilograms of sugar, 50 kilograms of flour, right? 
because because the idea was if why do it that way that if you give somebody 20 kilograms of rice 50 gram, kilograms of flour well you know that they're going to use it if you give them cash what if they decide to blow it away on something that's completely frivolous they go and buy another tv set okay i never really need a tv set right and particularly if you give it to men it's worse because then the chances are that the guy is going to go in the evening to the liquor shop and consume all of that money and have three bottles of imported liquor. And you know, by the way, in India, even today, good time to remind you of this, even today in India, either the first or the seventh of the month, because in some places you get paid on the first of the month, in some places you get paid on the seventh of the month. The first or the seventh of the month in most parts of India is what is called a dry day. Liquor shops have to be closed on that day. The day that the salary is dished out, liquor shops have to be closed. Because the, the worry is that if you don't do that, that the men will not take the checks back to their wives. Okay? Or to the house, or to their partners, you know, we, whatever you that they'll simply go to the liquor shop and they'll blow away virtually all of their money that evening. Okay, and that's why it's called a dry day. So either way, whether you have cash transfers or whether you have goods in kind, there could be problems. Okay, and these are the kinds of things that the people who have drafted the bill and people who have been charged with implementing it in various states and various sociologists and policy planners, these are the kinds of things that they keep on thinking about. And, and, and of course, that's exactly why the, the success rates, among many other reasons, why they vary from one state to another, because in different states, they've adopted different ways of dealing with the question of how do you actually pay people in kind or in cash. You know, if you pay them in cash, well, how do you effect these cash transfers and how do you ensure that the cash is not going to be misused? so forth and so on. Okay, so that is Narega. Uh, let me just go back to the previous slide. And, and one of the reasons when they passed the Narega, so of course the, the, the people who, who were in, uh, responsible for this, they invoked various articles of the Constitution. Article 41, which, is, which gives you the right to work. Article 16, right to equality of opportunity. Right, Article 21 of the Constitution, which says that you have a right to lead a life of dignity. Right? And that's one of the reasons why Narega was passed. The other ameliorative measure I want to look at, and, and once again, one last reminder, we're not saying that these are the only ones, there are hundreds of them. I'm looking at two or three of the really big ones. And one, the last one, which I'm going to look at in, in just a moment, one which is really quite innovative, and I think a very interesting one. Okay, so the second one is the Right to Education Act, passed quite recently, 2005. And the formal name is the Right of Children to Free and Compulsory Education Act. And applies to children between the ages of 6 and 14. And when we say compulsory, it simply means that the state has an obligation to provide facilities. Right? To children between the ages of 6 and 14 for a free education that if you do not want to send your child to a private school, or cannot afford to send your child to a private school, that you should be able to send the child to a state school. And of course, state schools are will be usually, the medium of instruction will be the language which happens to be the predominant language in that area. So if it happens to be North India, then the predominant language of, over there is Hindi, and that will be the language of instruction. If it's a, if it's a school in the state of Tamil Nadu, in South India, then the language of instruction will be Tamil, so forth and so on. Okay, um, education in India is a concurrent, that is a, a, a subject meaning that both the central government or what is called the federal government in the US, both the central government and state governments have a role to play in creating state policies. One of the other things that this act does, this last provision here, a very interesting provision, and again, leads to all kinds of situations which people don't quite know how to handle. Okay? And that is that it says that 25% of seats in all private schools will be reserved for people coming from poor backgrounds. 
Okay? So that would be the equivalent of saying, as some of you here might be familiar, there's a very elite private school in the LA area. It's called Harvard Westlake. You know, there might even be some graduates from that school here. I don't know. But anyhow, Harvard Westlake, well, it, you know, what the tuition bill is, right? It's about $40,000. Okay? So in India, the Right to Education Act stipulates that the equivalent of Harvard Westlake would have to reserve 25% of its seats for poor children. Now, what kind of problems does that raise? It raises all kinds of social problems, all kinds of social problems. And I know this firsthand because when I, you know, I was living back in India and relocated back a couple of times. So I was most recently, I was living there between 2010 and 2012. Okay, and before that in 2007, 8 when I was directing the University of California Education Abroad Program in India. So my children, you know, the whole family relocated and my children went to a private school. Okay, and we saw exactly what happened because this act is 2005 and so this act was already in place. Right, so my children go to this school and this is one of these private schools. And in these private schools, you know, and a lot of the kids and my kids at that time I'm talking about, you know, 10 year old and 7 year old, that kind of thing, okay. You know, so they have birthday parties, okay, for the kids. And so you have a birthday party, and the protocol is that you invite all the children in your class, okay, to the birthday party. So now you're inviting the daughter or son of a maid, and that maid, by the way, might be the maid who's working for you. Okay, and can you imagine the kind of social tensions because of course in all the, so there were occasions where we, we found out none of the rich kids showed up at all. None of them because they didn't want to be mixing around and all the 25% poor kids, they all showed up at the birthday party. So then you had these 25%, you know, swimming in a swimming, you know, having a swim in a swimming pool in a house which is valued at 30 million bucks. Okay. And none of the rich kids for whom the party had been designed showed up. All kinds of interesting social problems that you have to think about. You have to think about what happens when these kids who go to these schools, then when they come back home, well, it's a completely different world now. Because now you're the son of a maid or a driver or a gardener or whatever it is. Right? So when these policies are drafted, of course, a lot of the social planners are not thinking about that. And I am, by the way, not making an argument that I disagree with this provision. I'm not making even remotely an argument of that kind. I think it's fantastic that they have a provision of this kind. I'm just saying that you then have to think about a whole array of other issues and problems. Okay? All right, so I, I, I might not be able to take any questions for the moment because I, I just have a huge amount of material that I have to go through. So if I have time at the end, I'll pause briefly for two, three minutes, okay? Finally, the last ameliorative measure I want to look at, midday school meals, okay? Now, what are midday school meals? Midday school meals very simply means, okay, and again, this is something that you leave to the state. This is not a central government measure. Okay, midday school meals means that in a state, say the state of Andhra Pradesh, which has had a provision like this now for a substantial period of time, a couple of decades. In some states, they've only had this provision recently. Okay, so in a state such as Andhra Pradesh, where they've had this provision for a very long period of time, what it simply means is that the state government says that at every state owned school, every state school, a hot meal will be provided to children regardless of the economic condition of your family. A hot meal will be provided in the middle of the day, that will be your lunch, that's your midday school meal. Okay, now of course in some parts of the country even the rich kids might be sending their kids to the state school because there is no private school. And so some people said, well, yeah, why should they be getting a free meal? But then, of course, that creates other kinds of problems. And how do you, then you, have to, then you have to do more administrative bureaucratic work. Okay, demarcate the kids who are well off from those who are not well off. Okay, that, that you would have to do that first. And what happens when you have changing fortunes? Somebody who's relatively well off, well, then the next year, you know, you have a drought. Okay, 
because a lot of these families might be agricultural families. So in most states, what they said was, no, 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 this, this, is, not, this is too cumbersome. We're just going to give it to every kid who comes to school. And one of the reasons you want to do that is that you want to promote school attendance rates. Because in many of the states, they have found that even when you pass the Right to Education Act, the problem is there's really no penalty for children who don't come to school. Of course, they shouldn't be penalized anyhow. If you've got a six-year-old who's not coming to school, almost the, the, the uh, likelihood is that it's because the parents are either refusing to send the kid to school or they just couldn't care less, or most likely the child is being used to perform some services at home some labor at home. So if you have a 12 year old girl, what is a 12 year old girl going to do? She's got four younger siblings who are five months, eight months, 12 months and 24 months. She's going to be looking after those four siblings at home. Okay. And the, and the, and the act frankly provides, has no provision for penalty for parents who do not send their kids to school. So even though the, even though the, the act says that children have the right to this, education. The question is, how do you get the kids to go to school? And so one of the things that the midday school meal does, of course, is it gives an incentive, particularly to very poor families where there's no guarantee that there's going to be a meal in the evening. Now, if you can get a hot meal in the afternoon, you're going to get a hot meal in the afternoon, that's an incentive to, for the child to go to school. But then that, by the way, raises interesting problems. Let me give you an illustration, something that, you know, you wouldn't ever think about. Okay, so in the midday school meal, you get your rice and you get two vegetables and you get yogurt or curds as it's called in India. Okay, that's what you get, let's say. And you, you start getting used to that meal. Yeah, a kid goes there and says, mm, this is pretty nice, you know, and you start getting used to the meal. And what do you do? You go back home and in the evening, what you, what you eat is barley or millet. These are lower, lower grains, much lower than wheat, okay, or rice. And they have found that in some families, that there's been a big tension now within the family because the kids say, we don't want to eat barley or millet. We don't want to eat raw grains or coarse grains. We want rice. Rice is very expensive. Simple illustration. Okay, so you can, there can be all kinds of things. They also found that there were kids who were coming shortly before the midday school meal was served, and then as soon as they'd eaten the meal, they're off. Okay, how do you regulate that? And how do you regulate it when you have a school that has 200 kids and you've got only one children because four of the, four, four, one teacher, four of the teachers are absentee teachers. So if you read the Peace Sign Out book, I hope you did. I assigned some pages from that book, okay? That's exactly what you see. Schools that exist only in name. And sometimes they don't even have a building there. And the school teacher goes every month and collects a paycheck and then the rest of the 29 days is found napping in the afternoon in his home. Right? So, you know, these problems one can talk about endlessly, but I'm giving you, again, an illustration of a kind of an ameliorative social measure undertaken by the state. Okay, so this pretty much brings us to a close as far as the whole question of India's development, well-being, you know, economy, all of that is concerned. I mean, of course, one could add a great many things, but I've tried to give you some, um, uh, you know, uh, some, something of an argument about what is a macro picture from 47 down to the present day look at a few sectors and look at what development has been like in those sectors and then finally in this last section here what are some of the ameliorative measures undertaken by the state now i can take one or two questions very briefly if there are any uh, that have not been addressed before i move on to the next section yes uh, i i don't think i could give you a figure that would be that that would be a countrywide figure would be, would be virtually impossible. I'm not even sure that there are any statistics for the rate of alcoholism for India as a whole. The, for each state will generate its own figures. Uh, and of course, you know, we don't know how reliable those figures are because how do you determine that? You only can determine that when somebody 
goes to get treatment and the number of people who are going to get treatment is minuscule. So, so I would say that we're not really in a position. You can, do, you can look at anecdotal evidence that social workers have given and social workers who might have worked in a particular district or they might have worked in 10 villages over a period of time and they might say anecdotally, well, we think that the rate of alcoholism is 20% or 30%, whatever the case might be. But you, you see what I mean, right? That it would be impossible to come up with. One more question. Can you repeat the question again? The Rural Employment Act that you had on the board before yeah. exempted yeah. Kashmir like in other states. Do you know why that would be? Uh, why would that be the case? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to think about it. Yeah. OK? Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. It's not the state, by the way, that is really paying for their tuition. It's the school itself, effectively, that is paying for it. So what, what, what's happening, of course, is that there are people, the 75% who are not poor, okay, they are effectively subsidizing, okay? They're effectively subsidizing the 25%, yeah, because... This 25%, previous slide, this 25% could become a huge line item as far as a budget is concerned if the state were paying for it in every private school. So there may be schools, depending on the status of that school, its relationship, there may be schools where the state may, in fact, actually pitch in with, and again, in a certain state, they might, it might do it, but on the whole, no, this will be something that will be handled by the school itself. Okay? All right. Now, what we are interested in here, for the rest of the lecture today, going into next week, um, one lecture next week, uh, is the question of politics in India from 1947 to the present day. I've spoken about this in some ways tangentially, over here, here and there, you know, when I've talked to you about democracy, obviously we've been talking about politics. I've talked to you about the fact that one of the things happened in the post-1947 period, uh, in the immediate aftermath of 1947 and the drafting of the Constitution of India was what? The creation of universal suffrage, right? The, the fact that everybody got the vote in India, regardless of whether you were poor, rich, upper caste, lower caste, working class, male, female, Bengali speaker, Urdu speaker, whatever. Hindu, Muslim, right? That's what universal franchise is. And this is, of course, uh, you could say a great accomplishment, at least on paper, that the fact that, that in principle, no one could be denied the right to vote so long as they met, obviously, age conditions and so on, right? And we have seen that the electorate in India has grown tremendously, tremendously. Right? That, is a, that is the number of people who are entitled to vote. So in the last elections which were concluded just a few months ago, okay, in May, 1940, May, um, May of this year, May, May of 2014, when a new government came into power, uh, we, were ta we were talking about an electorate of 800 pl million plus. And we know that roughly 650 million, if I, I, may, not be, uh, I, may, I may not have the figures entirely um, in my mind, but somewhere in the vicinity of about 650 million people actually cast a vote. Okay, but that is, of course, only the beginnings of trying to understand politics in India in the post-1947 period. So what I want to do is I want to take you through, um, and we're going to have three sections uh, <coughs> to my lecture today and continue into my lecture on Tuesday, and, and that's domestic politics, uh, geopolitics, that is relations with neighboring states, and then India on the world stage, which would include such things as relations with, for example, the, the Soviet Union um, before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the breakup of the Soviet Union, and, and subsequently relations with Russia, uh, relations with the United States, what India's policy was, for example, during the Cold War. Yeah, what, what, what kind of position did India adopt during the Cold War? 
Right, so the, the, uh, when I say relations um, with neighboring states, I'm obviously talking about relations with Pakistan, um, West Pakistan and East Pakistan, and then eventually East Pakistan becomes Bangladesh in 1971, relations with Sri Lanka, Nepal, and so on and so forth. Right? And here, if you just quickly glance your, your eyes at this slide over here, uh, India on the world stage would include such things as the emergence of India as a nuclear power, uh, what have been some of the repercussions, how should we understand it, so forth and so on. But let me go back to the first of these considerations, and that is domestic politics. Uh, with the proviso, you should keep this proviso in mind that you can't always split these into neat segments and say that, well, this has strictly to do only with domestic politics. Okay? I mean, there, there are going to be many instances where we can't do that. I'll give you one simple illustration, which would also involve... Um, the United States. So in the 1970s, in the late 1970s, a secessionist movement arose in India. A secessionist movement, okay? And what was the secessionist movement? Uh, this was a movement by the Sikhs who wanted a separate state. Uh, and they called this state Khalistan, okay? This was the name that they gave to this state. Uh, and you know when a state becomes legitimate, what does... Uh, and it becomes a, a nation state that becomes recognized by uh, other countries, uh, what does a state do? It, among uh, many other things, it starts issuing passports. Okay? Then you know that a nation state has come into being. Right? So what, what, did, what did the proponents of Khalistan do? They started issuing passports. Of course, you couldn't fly anywhere in the world with a Khalistan passport because you'd get arrested immediately. Okay? Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's not a legal document. But that's what the secessionists wanted to do. And remember why I'm giving this example, because I'm saying to you that this looks like a domestic problem, but it's not just a domestic problem. Why? Because most of Khalistan supporters eventually left India and settled down in California. California was one of their big haunts. Imperial Valley, okay? And from here, they were trying to influence what was happening back in India. A comparable example for those of you who are of Irish background or have some understanding of Irish politics. I mean, this is something that happened in Irish politics for generations, right? That the Irish settled in the United States were trying to help the IRA, the Irish Republican Army, right? So what appears to be domestic politics may not be just domestic politics. That's all I'm trying to say, that, that I, for the purposes uh, of this lecture, partly so that we can render these things discreet, analytically discreet. I'm saying, well, there's domestic politics, then there's, you know, there's foreign politics or external politics, including politics with neighboring states, and then we have global geopolitics. But that these divisions may not, in fact, actually be neat and clean. So in the arena of domestic politics, however, what were the principal considerations? Right? Uh, what is it that had to be accomplished in the, in the early years uh, and then how did domestic politics change over a period of time? The first consideration obviously had to do with the integration of Indian states. Now, I've spoken about that to you before at some length. And when I, when I say integration of Indian states, what I'm talking about is all these native states. In 1947, when India becomes free, Pakistan becomes created, well, you have 500 plus native states and each of them is, is going to sign a treaty of accession and is going to become a part of India or it's going to become a part of Pakistan. Right? And for, most, for the most part, this was not a problem, but there were some states where this was a severe problem. <coughs> and I'm giving you the illustration of, of uh, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, uh, so if you look uh, over here, at this slide over here, uh, okay, so... Uh, and and, and I'm gonna, I want to combine the second point here, which is a reorganization of Indian states. So integration of Indian states and organize, reorganization of Indian states. So this is uh, the map of India 1956. And here you've got their Hyderabad city. And so you remember that Hyderabad, which was a province, it wasn't just a city. That, uh, the, the whole state of Hyderabad was run by the man known as the Nizam of Hyderabad, okay? a Muslim ruler. Um, um, presiding over what was a majority Hindu population, a majority Hindu population, although in the old city of Hyderabad itself, the majority population in some parts would certainly have been Muslim. But I'm saying 
overall, the state of Hyderabad was a, Mus was a Hindu majority state, uh, but, but uh, ruled by a Muslim ruler called the Nizam. Okay? Uh, and the Nizam was unwilling to sign a treaty of accession. So remember that the Indian government did what? Police action, they called it. They basically moved in with the army and absorbed Hyderabad. But there was an insurrection there. I mean, and the Nizam had a private army. So what you had was you had, you had, you obviously this was contested. Uh, you also had the communists who were extremely active there as well. Uh, so it will take too long to get into a description of exactly what was transpiring in Hyderabad, but that's an illustration of the problem of the integration of Indian states. And the man who was in charge of that was not Nehru, the Prime Minister, the man who was in charge of that was Patel. Okay, uh, Vallabhai Patel, also known as Sardar Patel, uh, nicknamed the Iron Man of India because he was a man who had this whole machinery, political machinery, he knew how to use the political machinery, you know, uh, he had a reputation for being a decisive figure. Okay. Uh, so Patel, and, and Patel is a deputy prime minister of India, by the way, so he's the second man after Nehru in the new Indian government post-1947, post-August 1947. So the integration of Indian states is the task before India in the initial years. There's also going to be a reorganization of Indian states because in British India, so, so let's look very quickly here. I'm just going to draw you a rough map. I think you'll uh, pretty much get the picture of what I'm talking about. So, okay, so here is India, and here you have just roughly here, so this is the Bengal Presidency, as it was called, and remember that Bengal is going to be partitioned, right? There's going to be an East Bengal, and there's going to be a West Bengal, and East Bengal is going to become East Pakistan, right? And then in 1971, it's going to become Bangladesh. So, You've got Bengal presidency here. This is what is called the Bombay presidency. These are huge administrative areas. This is, this is pre-partition, British India we're talking about. And then you've got native states. Okay, so they have the native states, you know, right? And there may be native states over here. And we're talking about over 500 of these. Now, when India becomes free, and the integration of the states takes place, one of the things that they want to do is they want to reorganize India administratively. And in essence, okay, I mean, I, we're going to have to generalize here. In essence, the plan is to create linguistic states. Linguistic states. So when I say linguistic states, so if you look at the Bengal presidency here, that's a good illustration. Okay, a simpler illustration. They're much more complicated cases. The map you're looking at here is actually a very complicated case of what's going to happen in the 50s because this reorganization of states on linguistic lines is going to take more than a decade to implement. Portions of it will be implemented immediately with relatively fewer problems. And what would be an illustration of, of fewer problems would be you take the Bengal presidency here, so all of this portion is Bengali speaking, okay? Bengali speaking. And this portion here, okay, where I put the X is, this is Oriya speaking. This is the language, Oriya speaking. So what do they do? They take most of the Oriya speaking districts, most of the Oriya speaking districts, and they transform it into a state called Orissa, which, by the way, had, has a few years ago been renamed as Orisha, okay? So this is what I mean by linguistic states, that you take, if there are 20 districts and they happen to be contiguous next to each other, okay, and they all happen to be largely Oriya speaking, what do you do? You put all of them together, draw the boundaries, and that becomes a state. Okay, so in South India, what you had over here was, so this, this is going to be the state of Kerala. And what is Kerala created from? It's created from three different states, Travancore, Malabar, Cochin. Okay, and why do you put all of these three together? Because predominantly the people in those three states, which now become part of Kerala, Predominantly, they are Malayalam speakers. 
Okay, so Kerala is basically what is the what is the mother tongue of uh, people growing up in Kerala for the most part Malayalam, and here you have the state of Tamil Nadu. Okay, and what would that be? Tamil speakers, and over here you have Andhra Pradesh. Okay, over here, and these would be Telugu speakers. In North India, you had quite a few people. Quite a few is not exactly the most illuminating phrase, I should say 400 million people, okay, right, for Hindi speakers. And that's not one single state, because that would be humongous, that would be huge, okay, but different states, Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, okay, and moving then, of course, into Delhi, which was not a state, it was a union territory, uh, uh, Rajasthan, which is partly Hindi speaking, Rajasthani speaking, Madhya Pradesh, which is central India, another Hindi speaking state, predominantly Hindi speaking state. That does not mean, by the way, that everybody who was living in that state, is, so if everybody living in, in Kerala is going to be a Malayali speaker, it doesn't mean that. It just means that predominant, that's a predominant language. And that's how you create these states. So if you look at this map of 1956 here, so you had a Mysore state, what used to be a Mysore state, okay, doesn't exist now, right? Because it got folded into a couple of other states, right? And so this was here, the, the Andhra state in blue, so portions of what were Mysore state were merged into Andhra. Which portions would be merged? Obviously, the portions which are close here, where you're going to have a substantial number of people who speak Telugu, okay? That is what, we're, that is, what is called the reorganization of Indian states, okay? And of course, they created a commission for that, you know, right? Uh, and these states are what are going to be known, as I said, principally as linguistic states. We could spend three, four lectures looking at some of the complications. We don't need to do that for the purposes of this class. You get pretty much an idea of a very broad-based idea of what was really involved in the creation of these linguistic states. Because remember that what we are interested in is we're trying to understand what are some of the principal political developments in India um, in the post-1947 period. Okay, so the integration of Indian states, the reorganization of Indian states, electoral reforms and universal franchise, which I've spoken about, abolition of untouchability. I'll come to that in a second. Let me look at number five first, and then I'll come back to abolition of untouchability, because that's a long subject. We've got a whole session devoted to caste issues, but we're going to start it today, okay? Very briefly, central state relations, point number five. The concern after 1947 was, how do you retain the unity of India, okay? How do you retain the unity of India? Uh, so if you look at point number six here, I'm talking about integrity of the Indian nation related to that. Uh, I'm not, but in, when I say unity of India here, I'm not thinking here for a moment about such things as political insurrections or insurgencies. Groups of people saying that, well, how do we really fit into this country, right? We're ethnically diverse. We don't speak any of the major languages. What if you happen to belong to a tribal group you belong to a tribal group, let's say Munda. I don't know, has anybody here heard of the Mundas? You haven't, right? There's no reason you would have. So it's a Mundas, large number of people. So the Mundas might say, how do we belong in something called the Union of India? We don't speak English, we don't speak Hindi, we don't speak Tamil, Telugu, any of the major constitutional languages. We're not Christian, we're not Hindu, we're not Muslim, okay? Ethnically, we are completely diverse. Our histories have never been recorded. And we happen to be not 400 in number, but 4 million in number. That's not, you know, it's not exactly pocket change that we're talking about here, right? We're talking about huge numbers of people here. And what if they happen to be 20 different groups of this kind? How do we belong? So this is a question that is, of course, in some ways paramount in the minds of people like Nehru, Patel, and many others. How do we accommodate everybody in this sprawling union? Now we know that in some places in the world, they've done it by coercion. That's one way in which you do it. There's some places where processes of homogenization are so remarkable, the United States being the best example, that after two generations, everybody loses their language, wherever they came from. They might have come from Timbuktu or Somalia or India or you know wherever, 
but after two generations, at the most, everybody is speaking English. Right? Well, that's homogenization. Everybody is speaking English, everybody is going to McDonald's or Burger King, whichever your preference is. Everybody is drinking either Coke or Pepsi, so forth and so on. You know, we can give the list of homogenization. I mean, it's, ex it's extraordinary. I mean, the degree of homogenization in this country is just something that bowls me over, you know, completely, right? Despite, quote, Yankee individualism, which Americans claim is distinct to this country, but everybody eats the same thing pretty much. You'd, you know, and everybody speaks the same language, and everybody believes that, yes, there's a real difference between uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum, uh, i.e. Republicans and Democrats, right? So now, what do you do in India? Right? How do you actually maintain the unity of India? Why do you prevent people from simply saying, I've got nothing invested here at all. This means nothing to me. This is a question that was going to be paramount. On the other hand, there's another concern. Because, of course, one way in which you say that you handle this is by saying, give people autonomy. As much autonomy as is possible. That on all matters related to culture, religion, language, leave these matters to the state government. That the central government or the federal government should have no role in adjudicating any of these matters. And you know, of course, that even in, the, even in American history, that's a paramount question. For those of you who remember your American history, it's a question that goes back to the Articles of Confederation. Before the Constitution of the United States was created, it goes back to the Articles of Confederation because the paramount concern there was that how do you get these colonies, different colonies, okay, to agree to some central form of government without relinquishing their own individual rights and character. Although there, again, the concern is, compared to India, it's nothing, because everybody's speaking English, for example. Now here you've got a problem. You remember what Mr. Sainath told you, OK? 800 languages. And we know that there are at least 100 that have not been counted. You know. How do you do it? And, and, and we're not talking about you know, languages that have 20 or 30 speakers. I mean, yes, a few of them actually only have a few hundred speakers left. But we're talking about languages that have half a million, million, 10 million, 20 million, 30 million, 40, 50, so forth and so on. So one solution is to simply say, let's leave a lot of matters to the states. Let them regulate it. But here's the other concern now. The other concern is, paramount concern was, that look, what is it that made India vulnerable to foreign rule. And people like Nehru were persuaded that what made India vulnerable to foreign rule before for centuries was the fact that there wasn't enough centralized power. You see? So there are these two different tensions now. Two different things that are coming into conflict here. So the impulse was to create a strong center. That is a unitary form of government <coughs> where most of the powers would be reserved to the central government and fewer powers to the state government. That's what I mean by center state relations. That in the study of Indian politics, this was going to be a paramount consideration for people who were involved in politics. How does one a portion power between the center and the states. Okay? Doing justice to people if possible, but also doing justice, as it were, to the aspiration to have a strong government, a strong central power, so that India can, in fact, actually not be vulnerable as it has been before. And of course, there are many other considerations which I cannot bring into the picture, such as the fact that, well, is it possible to speak of the cultural unity of India? That yes, there may be tribal groups who may have nothing to do, but that overall you could say that, well, the god Vishnu, or the god known as Shiva, or Rama, or Krishna, that all of these gods were worshipped throughout the country. Right? 
They might have been known by a thousand different names, but they were worshipped. The Vishnu was worshipped in the north, was worshipped in the south, east and west, and had been worshipped for centuries. So some people argue that there had always been a kind of a cultural unity in India, even though there had never been political unity, there had been political fragmentation. Okay, we're not going to be able to obviously resolve that question. I mean, this is something on which people write books, but this is what I mean in part when I'm speaking about central state relations. Now, an abolition of untouchability. We're going to have to talk about this at some length. In order to talk about it, uh, I just want to take three, four minutes that remain to set up the question of caste, and then we'll have to get to the question of um, untouchability uh, in my following lecture. Okay, and what I'm going to say there will be germane. Uh, not just uh, for the week ahead, but, but for a couple of weeks uh, and going into the rest of the term because this is obviously an extremely vital question. Okay, caste. What do we mean by caste? All right, and I'm not going to entertain answers right now because I want to quickly tell you what it is so that you can start thinking about it, okay? In every society that we know of, we have a system of stratification which is usually called class, okay? And class is supposed to be a vertical system of stratification. And when I say vertical system, you know what I mean, of course, because you've got the lower class, and you've got the middle class, and you've got the upper class. And then, of course, we can divide each of these, as I said, you know, right? So we can get lower, lower, middle, lower, et cetera, et cetera. All right? This is a system of stratification. And you can go up and down the ladder. You can go up and down the ladder and thus, you know, from, from, uh, uh, um, from poverty to riches, as it were. Okay? And you can go down. You might have a st stock fortune that's worth quite a bit. Collapse of the stock market, you sink. You go down the ladder. That's stratification. And of course, this is very simple, but, cl but class has various other ramifications. One of the things you have to understand, for example, is the idea of cultural capital when you speak about class. I'm giving you one illustration. Right? What do we mean by cultural capital? So what I mean, I'll give, give you an example. Of cultural capital would be that, for example, someone like myself who's you know, highly educated okay, and fancies himself an intellectual, whether one is or not, okay, and you're a university professor, now if someone comes and visits me in my home, I wouldn't want to be found dead with a Reader's Digest on my coffee table book. Okay? Because Reader's Digest, that's not what intellectuals read. That, that's what you read if you're living in a small little village or town in Nebraska. You know? uh, and you do all your shopping at, at Walmart. And you've never shopped anywhere else. You've never heard of something called organic food. Okay? I'm just sort of laying out the scenario for you. I'm not saying I have anything against anyone living in Nebraska. I'm telling you what cultural capital means. Okay? That what would I want to be found having on my coffee table book when my visitors come and meet me? I want them to see that I've got Marx on the table or Picasso, something like that. Okay, yeah, you know, the person has some interest in art and I'm listening to Beethoven, so yeah, I know someone's coming. Let me quickly put on Beethoven's cello concerto. You know, they'll say, wow, man, this man listens to... That's cultural capital. If you have money, what do you do? Have you ever thought about why people, you know, if they have huge amounts of money, what do they do? They buy art. That's not because they necessarily know art better. They might not be able to distinguish a Picasso from a Giotto. Yeah, they might be complete idiots, but they've just got a hundred million bucks but cultural capital means that when you go to their home, you see, ah, Matisse, Picasso, okay, it's all hung on their walls. That's cultural capital. So there are many ways in which, and so therefore going to Harvard is a form of cultural capital. And that's why people put stickers on the back of their cars, my son went to Harvard, you know, right? Or I went to Harvard, I went to Yale. I mean, if you went to you know, Ball State University, you don't want to be putting a sticker in the back of your car saying, I went to Ball State University. That, because that does not earn you cultural capital. So class is a very complicated matter. This, it involves all kinds of things. It's not just a matter of mobility. It's a matter of cultural capital. It's a matter of assets, so forth and so on. Caste is a different institution. Okay, how is it different? Because in India, you've got both class and you've got caste. 
You are born into a caste. I'm simplifying it. There's a huge discussion about it. I, and, and I've been working on literature having to do with caste, so I know that I'm going to have to enormously generalize and simplify it. Okay? But caste is something you are born into. Okay? And so th according to the books, there were four castes. I'll just tell you what they are and we'll stop for the day. So they are Brahmins. And then I'll tell you in my next lecture why this view has to be rethought a little bit. Brahmins are the priestly caste, the top of the ladder. Okay, the priests, the intellectuals, all of that. Kshatriyas, technically warriors, high level administrators. Okay, that's what the books tell you, the ancient books. Then you've got the Vaishyas. Who are the Vaishyas? The people who are shopkeepers, tradesmen. Okay, small time entrepreneurs. And then you have at the bottom the shudras. Okay, and who are the shudras? These are the people who do the hard labor. They might be the ones who might be cleaning the streets, picking up the garbage. Landless laborers would be included within the shudras. Okay, rough. That's, you are born into one of these castes if you're born into a Hindu family. All right, I'm gonna stop there. I'm gonna then start looking in some detail at what are some of the problems, who the untouchables are, and what was the intention of the Indian government with respect to the question of the abolition of untouchability. Okay?